our first speakers will be Andrea and uh, Yeroun. And um, they have uh, very interesting results to share with us. Uh, so Dr. Andrea Chiarelli and Yeroun Sondervan um, who will uh, speak on behalf of Knowledge Exchange uh, Initiative, uh, joining forces to publish re reproducible research outputs. Um, so over to you, Yeroun and Andrea. Yes. Um, let me see. Uh, does it work, the screen sharing? Yes, perfect. Yes, okay. So thanks, Irina and uh, Force 11 for this opportunity uh, to present this poster on the report with the title, The Art of Publishing Reproducible Research Outputs, Supporting Emerging Practices Through Cultural and Technological Innovation. Um, my name is Juno Sondervan, working at Utrecht University Library as Open Access Publishing Consultant. And today I'm representing the Knowledge Exchange Group um, as a member of the Open Access Working Group. And I'm here with Andrea Chiarelli, um, Senior Consultant at uh, Research Consulting. Um, the Knowledge Exchange commissioned this report with research consulting and the purpose of this activity was to explore current practices and barriers in research reproducibility with a focus on the publication and dissemination stages. We wanted to determine how technical and social infrastructures can support future developments in this area. And in this report, we defined research reproducibility as cases where data and procedures shared by the authors of a study are used to obtain the same results as in their original work. For the report, we investigated the research reproducibility landscape between 2020 and 2021. And the results are based on an extensive review of almost 130 sources, uh, mostly academic papers, um, and a mix of interviews and focus groups with 51 stakeholders from 12 countries, mostly in Europe, but also uh, um, including the US. And some of our key findings um, include that reproducibility is evidently part of the vision for open science alongside concepts such as replication uh, and robustness. Um, stakeholder collaboration and alignment is needed to continue developing reproducible publication practices across disciplines. And incentives and rewarding for reproducible publication practices are currently very limited and demand for training and support is growing. Um, an open door maybe, but the management, curation and sharing of research data and methods are crucial conditions for reproducible publication. And many technological solutions to enable reproducibility are already available, but it seems that interoperability between them is one of the key gaps to advance in this area. I'm now handing over to Andrea to talk about the recommendations and possible steps the different stakeholders involved can make. Andrea? Thanks, Jeroen. So yeah, I'll now tell you a little bit about stakeholder roles and responsibilities to make concrete progress in the publication of reproducible research outputs, mainly building on Jeroen's point around stakeholder collaboration. So you can see in our poster that we have looked at different stakeholder levels, and namely micro, meso, macro. And this is based on the KE Open Scholarship framework, framework, which is in the bottom left corner. I'll say something about all three levels, starting from micro and macro, and then moving on to the more complex meso level. So at the micro level, we have researchers and research groups, and we found that the key responsibilities here are to work in a reproducible way, which may include peer reviewing for reproducibility, and to share appropriate research objects, meaning data, code, methods, and anything that's relevant to any given publication. At the macro level, so the opposite end of the spectrum, uh, so uh, mainly research funders and policymakers. The key responsibilities perceived by project contributors were to cover some of the costs of reproducible practices, including infrastructures, so paying for uh, infrastructures needed to publish in a reproducible way, and to make publicly funded infrastructures a policy priority, so making sure that policymakers uh, and, uh, and funders devote enough, enough funding and effort to this area. The MISO level is where things get more complicated because a lot of different players are involved. And as a result, collaboration and synchronization are very important. Um, here we have different communities uh, of uh, disciplines. We have universities, service providers, and more. Essentially, most higher education stakeholders that support the day-to-day -day role of researchers. And uh, so at the MISO level, some of the key responsibilities are to discuss and implement disciplinary requirements setting and raising awareness of policy expectations, which includes enforcing these, 
resourcing support staff in both research organizations and journals. So roles like reproducibility editors in a journal or reproducibility librarians, data curators, uh, and uh, uh, subject specialists in libraries. And last but not least, at the MISO level, we need players to foster the right research cultures for research reproducibility to be taken up by more and more researchers. And so I'm sure it's quite clear that it won't be too easy to make reproducible publication practices an everyday reality. But if all these stakeholders are aligned and join forces, then we can definitely get there as a community and make sure that reproducibility is embedded, as Jerome said, in the open science vision. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Um, very interesting and useful. So if you have any questions to Yeroen and Andrea, please post them in the um, Q&A. And I'm happy to introduce our next speaker, Alison Lister. And uh, she's from Fair Sharing, University of Oxford, sir. And she'll talk about Fair Sharing, promoting the value of standards and repositories for scholarly communication. So over to you, Alison. Thank you very much. Uh, how many minutes uh, should I take, just as a reminder, sorry? Five minutes, if possible. Five minutes. Oh, that would be perfect. Thank you. OK, so welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming to listen to our presentations today for all the speakers. Um, I am the content and community coordinator for Fair Sharing, so I get to spend my time talking with our users. And I want to give you a little overview of how fair sharing gets used in aid of scholarly communication and collaboration, and also some of our new features, because you might see the ribbon at the top there that says that we've got a new beta site. Uh, we will move the new site over to the old site in January, but in the meantime, please come and make any edits at beta.fairsharing.org and give us your opinion. So fair sharing. Well, we have two main routes into fair sharing. On the one hand, we have consumers of fair sharing who like to come to visit us to discover new resources. Now, this might well be because they are planning training materials, writing up data management plans. Maybe they're researchers looking for a place to find their data. You also have producers who come to fair sharing. These are the people who come to, to us to make their resources more visible, more adopted and more cited. So you can create a record on fair sharing with us if you produce a database, a data standard of a variety of different types or even a data policy. So the producers will come not only to increase the visibility of their resource, but also in the example of data policies to list those resources they recommend. We also allow organizations such as uh, community associations and you, you know, various uh, community organizations like the RDA, like Force 11, to come and create their own view of fair sharing with us because you can create collections in fair sharing, which allow you to group those policies, databases, and data standards in a way that suits your particular community. Uh, I apologize for some of the font size on this poster. Please do take a look at it on the Zenodo uh, page for Force, uh, Force 11 and Force 2021 because um, I tried to put as much as I could on and I fear the text has gone a little bit by the wayside and it's just a wee bit small. But uh, follow along and I'll give you an overview. So uh, we, I talked already about the policies, databases, and data standards. The really lovely thing about fair sharing and the part that I personally like playing with the most is the relationships that we can create among all of these records in fair sharing. So we can say which standards your database implements, which standards and databases a data policy recommends, which standard is extended by another standard, all sorts of interesting relationships. And this is represented in fair sharing through the relationship graph, which you can see on the right hand side of the poster as a little bit of a hairball, again, because of its size, apologies, but I just wanted to make the point that we have those graphs for every single record in fair sharing. So pick your favorite, find it in fair sharing and take a look at that relationship graph and do let us know if we've missed anything. We also have a, a hierarchy of research areas and we display that to our users through the subject browser, which we've just released in the last week. 
This hierarchy of subject areas is created from seven community ontologies and vocabularies. We try very hard not to reinvent the wheel. And as some of my co-presenters know about ontologies, that's a very easy and tempting thing to do. But our subject hierarchy draws from externally uh, available community ontologies and so does our other vocabularies. We use over 50 external vocabularies to tag records in fair sharing. Uh, I just wanted to also point out right at the very end that we also have a brand new API. So we can have programmatic access to fair sharing if you are a tool writer and we can, you can both read data and write data. So if you are a very handy tool writer and you're a producer of a resource and wish to update your record, you can do that through the API as well. That is nearly my time. And so I just wanted to reiterate that we work with a lot of collaborators and organizations. We're part of the RDA and Force 11 and Elixir, and we work in working groups with them and with GoFair, and we've worked together with data publishers, sorry, with publishers and data publishers, as well as a number of other funders and organizations to make fair sharing right for the whole research community. So I welcome any input and comment on the new site or on anything that you might have questions about. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Alison, and um, thanks a lot for everything you're doing in fair sharing. Uh, it's, it's very, very useful. So please, colleagues, if you have any questions to Alison, post them um, in a Q&A. And um, I'm happy to introduce our next speaker, who is uh, Julian Franken from TIBA Leibniz Information Center for Science and Technology. And he'll talk about discoverability and trustworthiness uh, evaluation of conferences. Uh, over to you, Julian. And your slides are not in a presentation mode yet. Okay. Yeah, perfect now. Introduction. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm the. I'm, my name is Julian. I'm the confident. Uh, I'm the project manager in the confident project. Um, the confident project is about. Let me switch this here a little bit to the right. Um, the confident project is about um, creating a digital platform for uh, researchers to inform themselves about academic events like conferences, for example. And in this um, particular presentation, I want to focus on um, the aspect of confident, which is uh, try to try to um, support, especially early career scientists with uh, making the right and quotes a choice of attending uh, an event. So as you can see here um, on the top left, there are a lot of different conferences and amongst them, there are also uh, conferences that should be regarded as uh, less trustworthy or maybe even called predatory conferences. And um, in particular, early career scientists and those um, finding themselves in a situation where they might not have the best mentorship or don't have uh, necessary peer support, they sometimes struggle with finding the right conference or, or avoiding predata predatory ones. Um, so, so uh, yeah, th this is what Confident is about. We want to create a database and search platform for trustworthy conference events. Um, and I uh, hope this is visible here. Uh, yeah, provide metadata about conferences so we can aid researchers in finding uh, the right ones. Um, we are um, trying to do this by, um, as you can see here, by becoming a whitelist. And um, by that, uh, I mean, we are looking at um, some trustworthiness clues. I got these, this, this list is uh, derived from the literature and from a lot of checklists online you can find. And um, uh, on the basis of this, these lists, we try to create indicators and make them measurable. For example, um, costs would be a clue that indicates something about trustworthiness. And of course, if you have um, a higher than average fees excuse me, this shouldn't, shouldn't be a, a green check mark, this should actually be an attention mark here, then this might be an indicator for a, a conference uh, not um, looking after the um, interest of uh, advancing science, but more, uh, more looking after monetary gains. Another example here would be looking at event history and uh, here a long serious history would indicate that, um, yeah, this should be a rather trusted um, uh, because it kind of, uh, because uh, yeah, it has shown in the past that it uh, is a conference that um, has a um, has an uh, an attendance. So, and uh, on the right column here, you can see um, that we are trying to create a workflow here, 
which is based first on an automated process where we try to uh, um, use these first um, put into indicator uh, made into indicators um, data so we're trying to evaluate uh, data with an algorithm here and then um, the next part of the process would be to also involve uh, a detailed evaluation by an expert community uh, resulting in the decision to include or reject a certain conference and of course this whole process is supposed to be um, transparent um, so this is um, so far this is the uh, the template, <laughs> how we imagine this is going to work. Um, and of course, as you can imagine, um, there are a lot of challenges with that. Uh, here I highlighted on the left, let me go first back here on the left, I highlighted uh, the, the gr green clues. Those are actually kind of easy or easier to, um, to be put into measurable indicators. The ones below here marked with the, with the red um, box, those are pretty hard to put into measurable data. So um, yeah, challenges of course are uh, first of all getting rich metadata with these indicators, um, uh, highlighted here by the red corner. As I, as I just said, is making clues measurable. Um, the automated evaluation, of course, is only as good as the uh, metadata. Um, clues can be very specific to a certain disciplines. So the computer sciences, for example, they rely heavily on kind of rankings or something called acceptance rates. Um, but this is very discipline specific. So uh, you can't just extrapolate this onto every other discipline. Um, even experts, of course, they disagree sometimes. Um, and trustworthiness changes over time. So um, conferences are evolving. Series usually have a, a conference every year or every second year and some kind of um, regular um, tournaments, um, and that means they can their, their quality can change over time too, or um, the the editorial board can change, and so so many factors that um, make you have make you have to re reevaluate things over and over again. Um, and one of the biggest points here, the peer review process is rarely transparent. Um, in my opinion, um, looking at the peer review process of conferences, similarly to um, publications. Uh, should be one of the main indicators to judge something uh, like trustworthiness uh, but not having peer-reviewed processes as transparent as possible makes that very hard uh, and of course this whole matter here um, uh, is this th these things are not black and white so obviously at a very predatory conference even there you can have published um, you can have uh, scientists that are uh, presenting their research in the in their best in, in the best possible way and there's good research presented so the gray areas are usually much wider than the black and white white ones and of course um, with this whole um, uh, theme of um, trying to sort the, the bad apples out <laughs> in quotes uh, you there's a big potential for discrimination against conferences um, not coming from the global global north uh, all in all um, creating a whitelist is a hard endeavor um, and um, as I hinted at here with my first uh, first point at the top corner, even even we expect to include some predatory ones at the first, at, at least in the, at the first in the first iterations, and um, getting into a to, into a state where we can confidently say um, this is only uh, this this data set only includes good conferences will be hard, and in the end. Uh, the researcher themselves always uh, have to make the final judgment. We can only try to support them as best as we can. Thanks for your attention. Thanks a lot, Julian. Very timely and interesting. Um, and um, if you have any questions to Julian, please pose them uh, in the Q and A. Or if you're a speaker, please pose them in the chat, and we'll keep an eye on that, sir. And uh, now it's my pleasure to present Dr. Jo Havemann from Access to Perspectives, uh, and she'll talk about research capacity, reality, equality, equity. So over to you, Jo. Hi, thank you. I'm just um, sharing the correct link for the website I just mentioned. And now um, the link to the mirror board. I would like to invite you for a quick, oh, start the timer, um, for the five minutes um, and a quick session on Miro, for which I'll be sharing the slide. You can access the mirror board 
um, yourselves if you wish, or just follow um, through screen share. That's easier for you. Um, but for those of you who are used to Miro and also anybody else, feel free to just grab a sticky note and leave your comments just here, or as we all know in the Q and A. Um, and I will make sure to you know if you leave the comments on Miro, I'll make sure we um, transform them also to the to the Forest Twenty One organizers. Um, you might have seen the sketch um, about equality, equity, or the difference between equity and equality is how it started. And then people and also the, the artists themselves, they added more um, boxes, like not the boxes people are standing on, but the boxes like the images to it. And that's a project called the fourth box, which you also find the link in this ad, like in this yeah, underneath this artwork here. And then there was a comment on LinkedIn by Asha Abdile, who pointed out that this is very nice and fine and this triggers some thought, but the problem is not with, with, with the people in most cases where we find inequality and imbalance of and power dynamics, um, it's about the systems nowadays. And also like referring back to yesterday's keynote by Leslie Chan and others who are, including myself, who are very much concerned about or promoting um, equity in research and research capacities and working on a globally inclusive um, research environment and ecosystem for us all to thrive and enjoy. Thrive in and enjoy this is basically what I try to develop. There's two versions now that you find on the Nodo and you're probably looking if you have opened the Nodo link on version two. Um, version one was more complicated and I, like in my trainings as an open science trainer or science an open science and science communication i always struggle like many of us here to convince the researchers to embrace open science um and it's also been mentioned here um adoption of open science practices is still slow so i was hungry and also in, um what is this um not influence also influenced but encouraged by the scheme by this comic strip to come up with a simple to understand version um, that can be shared, like to basically make it easily accessible what we're talking about when we mention globally inclusive research, how this can be achieved. So, okay, the time is running out already, <laughs> but um, two more minutes. Um, so we're looking here at four bo boxes, reality, which is like what the system we currently live in, equality, equity, and justice. Can we make this a little bit bigger? And then you have, colored boxes and the different levels, research capacity, access to funding, prestige and privilege. Um, just think about high-impact vector journals um, and other prestigious things researchers are being bullied into bad scientific practices, open science practices, which is what we're promoting here at this conference for the most part. And then what, how would equality look like, equity and justice? And now if we um, skim through what this looks today and then collapse the boxes um, to what, okay, maybe I should explain the three pillars. So this is a resource rich institution or country or whatever you want, level you want to look at. This is medium size, like, you know, a, a random, mid-sized university in, in Europe, or center in Western Europe. And this is low resource capacity, which is Africa, Latin America, Southeast Asia, and also small universities in Western countries for you. And now how can we achieve equity? And you see like the, the, the trigger for changes of open science, basically the message of this poster. And um, yeah, and then also how access to funding, because equality basically calls for equal access to funding, but we need investments in under-resourced research institutions and countries for research and development. So this basically, like I'm trying to visualize here why this is important, not only for the people and the researchers concerned who live and work under low resources conditions, but for everybody's benefit, as was pointed out in today's keynote um, by UNESCO Shamila. Um, yeah, and this is just so you get an idea of where this is coming from. And this is also meant to be iterated further. So whoever has graphical skills, um, feel free to jump on a call with me and we can develop this further. And of course you will get your um, acknowledgement of contributions. Thank you very much. And we, please leave your comments.
to the board or in the chat or wherever. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Joe. So, yeah, also very important and timely. So if you have any questions to Joe, please either post them in the mirror board or in the Q&A or in a chat. Sir. And now it's my pleasure to introduce um, Scott Edmonds from uh, Giga Science Press uh, BGI Hong Kong. And he'll talk about uh, a new endeavor beyond the version of records, uh, bringing publications to life. So over to you, Scott. Thanks. So is my um, presentation showing? Yes. Excellent. All right. Well, uh, I won't stop my timer. Yeah. Thank you for um, uh, letting me speak here. I love. I always love the force meetings. Um, so. I am going to present, um, I'm going to bring my poster to life, uh, which with, with some demos, which is about bringing publications to life. Um, so the keynote um, earlier really kind of set, set this up great, you know, talking about sort of, uh, you know, red alert for humanity, um, all of the challenges that we have. And uh, research is, is, you know, open science is needed to, to tackle this. The vector that uh, research has been communicated is for th over 300 years is the scientific publication. And it's not really been fit for purpose. Um, you, where things need to be disseminated as widely as possible, you know, it's expensive, held back by uh, various barriers. Um, trust is a huge issue here. And, and the whole process is, is, is completely untransparent. Um, very slow because of laborious tech, and the key the key things we need in this data driven era are, are data and software and and methods and and everything's been um, you know there just haven't really been incentives to date, um, and and it needs to be understandable that the public and, and policymakers need to be able to interact with this stuff and 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 you know jargon and language and and the like holds us back. So the key things that we really need are trust speed and, and interaction. And so um, this is why uh, we launched this. this we, we basically started from scratch with, with new publishing tech, um, working with River Valley Technologies, who've made this amazing end-to-end, uh, -end, everything in XML workflow. And so to, to, to tackle this, we, we publish data, we publish software, we've got curators to kind of uh, massage this stuff and then it's kind of in an XML wrapper and doing everything in XML lets you do a, a couple of cool things which I'll quickly demo. So for example, um, you have a, you've got a, a, a paper in the language, click a button, you can change the language. Um, ultimately, you, you can you can pivot and just change change the views. Put a put a font for the visually impaired. Um, you can view this any any which way you like, right? Just regenerate ultimate uh, you know um, unlimited diff different views that are, uh, are curated. Um, having everything in XML uh, means you and 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 everything built on 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 open data and open software means you can uh, plug in any kind of visualization extremely easily um and so the the here are some examples of from our actual papers um of, of these kinds of curated objects you know video the fantastic tool like OpenStreetMap um, that you can use instead. Um, any kind of data that you have, um, you can, uh, you know, like, so imaging data, for example, uh, you can kind of interact with it in the paper. If you like it, um, you know, if, 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 you, if you trust it, then um, view, it, view it in different ways. You can um, kind of click a button and uh, and view it in a you know virtual reality headset, for example. Um, this is uh, from a sort of climate change uh, study, um, and and you know ultimately you can just download it and send it to a three D printer. Um, really changing the way you interact with these things. Um, soft open software you can execute it in the paper through collation plugins. Um, we've been able to convert to uh, Stencilla views. Um, so you can um, basically uh, push a button, interact with the code underlying all of the individual figures. You can edit it, tweak it, uh, regenerate it. Um, if, if, if needs be, really building trust. This was actually a coronavirus um, paper example. And, um, you know, wet lab protocols, uh, it's, it's, it's great. Emma is here, you know, what, 
why use static, why have static textual protocols when you can embed um, protocols.io ones? Um, thinking about our, our machine readers who are, who, who are ultimately going to, to grow and grow and grow, the things that we really need to, to focus on, are, 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 it's not, not the PDFs, right? Not the packaging, but the, the data, the code, and the entities in the paper, like persistent identifiers, the, the, ultimately the facts. And so the, we really think that this, you know, provides an opportunity to really rethink uh, what publishers have been doing, this focus on version of record and, and changing it to version of reproducibility, focusing on these usable parts and, and discarding the packaging, give people credit for doing this really cool stuff, sharing the digital stuff. Um, and the XML only workflow also really um, uh, automates so much of this that it, 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 it's, it's quicker and cheaper, chucking out 95% of the production as well. So this is, yeah, this is um, what we've done with, with Gigabyte and um, this technology um, we're, we're using in a new publishing house. So any questions, let us know and please interact with our papers and have a play. Thanks a lot, Scott. Very exciting and I love the version of reproducibility. It sounds great. So please, colleagues, if you have any questions to Scott, uh, put them um, in the Q&A. And now I'm happy to present our next speaker, Ginny Evans. Uh, We'll talk about uh, practice made practical, reducing the author of known text. Uh, so over to you, Jenny. Okay, thank you very much. Can you see my screen and hear me? Okay. Yes. Amazing, thank you. So hi everyone, I'm Jenny Evans. I'm Research Environment and Scholarly Communications Lead at the University of Westminster, based in London in the UK. Uh, we're a university that engages in a lot of practice research in the arts and architecture, uh, which is kind of where, where I'm coming from here. Um, I'm here today presenting on behalf of my colleague, Adam Biles Moore, who's unwell and unable to join, so get well soon, Adam, uh, Rachel Katarski and Taylor Muds. Uh, so we've been working together as a group now for a while um, to think about this area, practice made practical, reducing the other of non-text. Uh, it's quite a broad piece of work and this post focuses mainly on uh, the metadata kind of elements. Um, Repository software has traditionally focused, as we know, on scientific journal articles, uh, monographs, uh, book chapters, uh, very much text-based research. Um, although obviously data repositories and discoverability are now a real feature of this landscape. As such, discovering this research uh, is, it works quite well. It's not perfect, but it does work quite well. Uh, outputs that fall outside these traditional boundaries, uh, so, and also those where there might not be a funder expectation to make a work open, uh, have tended to be a lower priority. So this poster really articulates the challenges uh, that disciplines that share research with primarily non-text outputs uh, face. So this is building on a presentation we did at Pitapalooza earlier this year, uh, and it's informed by the experiences of repository development at the University of Westminster and the British Library, uh, and in collaboration at Westminster with uh, Cayus, uh, Haplow, the Haplow repository developers, uh, and the work that JISC and the British Library have been done in their, their PID uh, consortium roles. So at Westminster, we work with our practice-based arts research community uh, to develop a repository that captures all research outputs, uh, and the flexibility of the architecture we use in our open source Haplo repository enables us to do this. The British Library uh, provides a shared repository service infrastructure to support galleries, libraries, archives and museums organisations uh, that are also independent research organisations to share their research. They've been piloting this repository uh, with the British Museum, Museum of London, Archaeology, National Museum, Scotland, Royal Botanic Gardens, Q, and the Tate to understand how this research contents uh, could be made discoverable. So what do we mean by non-text outputs? Uh, so this, we're talking about artifacts, we're talking about compositions, designs, visual media, performances, um, this idea of practice research, um, the fact that these, these outputs aren't one single output, they're, they're generally a collection of objects or outputs, and not just the output or object, but the documentation, uh, the process or the practice and, and the narrative about this process. So it often is a collection of work rather than a single work uh, that might change over time. Collaborators are really important to this group. Um, outputs may have multiple pages, files, permissions, uh, images, uh, and IP and copyright challenges. So um, I guess the other thing to say is that though we're coming very much from supporting uh, creative arts and architecture 
uh, researchers, practice research does cross disciplines. It's not only applicable uh, to the arts, it's certainly applicable in engineering, health and education as well, but really does apply to all disciplines. So in the UK, uh, there's a group called the Practice Research Advisory Group uh, who funded some research carried out by uh, James Brawley and Osden Sahin at Goldsmiths University earlier this year. They published two reports uh, known as the Prague reports or the Prague UK reports. One was around what practice research was and the second talked about how practice research could be shared. Uh, key recommendations of that report, project item type. So that's kind of what we're displaying kind of on the left of that, our poster is that idea of what practice research is and, and some examples from our repositories, uh, identifying things like uh, recording collaborators, exhibition records, having more than one date uh, and multiple files with multiple permission levels. So the discoverability landscape. So where does non-text or practice research fit? Um, how does it fit? Generally, we would say it fits at the moment into other or, or you've got to work out what the best fit is. Uh, I think what this also, the poster illustrates is the connectivity across the landscape. So if it isn't quite right in one part of this landscape, then uh, it doesn't work in other areas. So for example, open air uses the core COAR resource types. Um, I think it's also helpful and, and useful to acknowledge work is being carried out. So it's not that things aren't happening. Uh, it's just that uh, there's still work to be done. So if we look at our persistent identifiers, uh, ORCID, for example, you need to add an output as other. Uh, and there was a work types event carried out in June 2020, so well over a year ago now. There was lots of discussions, challenges, how granular should we get? Uh, it is a standard, not a discipline taxonomy. Definitions of terms uh, and going back to this idea that disciplines uh, see things differently. Datasite is also doing work uh, around uh, collections, so you can manage collections in metadata. Contributor roles don't quite reflect that collaborator role I mentioned. Um, public landing pages are required, but some practice re research may be closed metadata records. Uh, so that's helpful to understand. Uh, the RAID or project identifier, um, the persistent identifier research projects that have been created in Australia is looking interesting and certainly applies to the, the Prague report recommendations. So moving on to metadata, I guess the other thing to say in terms of persistent identifiers in Crossref, understandably, where it comes from in terms of text-based outputs, you'd, you'd have to select other um, and it, it probably wouldn't map very well. In terms of metadata standards, uh, we've got resource out types, which one do we pick? Uh, credit, obviously, again, the, it really reflects the, the, the basis of this discoverability landscape coming from a scientific background. So, so in, there is work being done around credits, which is now managed by NISO, uh, and we hope to see changes there soon. Uh, REOX, uh, there is very much publications-based standards, so um, it ends up as other. So just finally, because I'm guessing I'm running out of time, uh, so that discoverability uh, landscape in this area, uh, web pages are so much more important because this discovery landscape doesn't reflect this research. So uh, CORE, for example, harvests text as does Google Scholar and, and actively rejects effectively practice research. Um, repositories are not so good at SEO. Uh, so things like mobile optimized design, semantic markup, uh, including keywords in item types and canonical links. So really just to finish with um, what we want to do is to enable richer, more descriptive work types, which will allow better discoverability and reproducibility and bring a future where all research is equally valued. So I finish with asking you to join our chorus at PR Voices on Twitter uh, if you're interested in our work uh, as we move forward. Uh, so that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jenny. It's very interesting and very, very relevant. Thank you so much. So if there are any questions to Jeannie, please post them um, in a QA. and a um, And um, I'm happy to present our next speaker, who is um, Hannah Zontak uh, from uh, European Molecular Biology Organization. And she'll talk about S dash accelerating collaborative data sharing with smart figures. Um, so over to you, Hannah. Uh, thank you, Irina. Um, hi, I'm Hannah Sontag. I am the Source Data Coordinator at Embo Press. And I want to make the most of my five minutes, so I jump right in. So 
So we at Embo Press, we're always looking for ways to make research data more accessible and overall, you know, make it more, make research more efficient. And one of our approaches is the source data platform, which I briefly want to touch on. So um, if you want to, you can visit right now sourcedata.embo.org and you will find that we have a lot of beautifully curated smart figures there. Because what we do for the source data project is that we curate figures from publicated papers um, and we capture the key players of each of these experiments and capture them in a structured way so that we get experimental metadata. So if you want, we make the hypothesis of each of these experiments uh, machine readable. So by this, um, we enrich the experimental data and we create something that we call the smart figure. These smart figures then are also deposited in a public repository in the BioStudies um, database. And it's not just the added information that we have added, it's also the figure and also the underlying data. So we kind of create a little package that is somewhat self-sustained. And this package is now available to everyone, even though the paper itself might have been behind a paywall or such. And so um, we make this accessible to people and by having these machine readable um, information added to the experiments, we also make them searchable. So you can discover new relationships between experiments that would otherwise maybe remain hidden if they were not machine readable and deposited in our database. So this is how we make um, experiments discoverable, but unfortunately the discoverability itself is only one part of a problem. And source data, you know, with this project, we can only look at published data, but often data never gets to the point where it's actually published. And there are some reasons for this. And it's a shame that lots of data will never see the light of day if you want so. And we were thinking about how to help this problem. And one problem is that um, researchers in their daily life sort of face issues about how to share their data, how to organize their data. Um, often you, you wonder how can I provide my collaborators with the access to raw data, which are you know large data sets and still make it easy to understand. Or sometimes maybe researchers just ask themselves, where did I keep the data I produced two years ago? And we think that the smart figure packages are an ideal way to um, help out here because these figures that are packaged and self-sustained are a good way to organize and communicate, communicate research. So we have created a platform that's called S Dash. That's the smart figures dashboard. And on the dashboard, you can um, upload and create your own uh, smart figures in an easy, painless way, supposedly. And um, once you have them in the dashboard, you can organize as many underlying data types um, to them as you want. And then you have this package that you can share with your collaborators. They can give you immediate feedback. And eventually, if you wish to, you can make this smart figure package then even public and you could use it for conferences or um, for the preparation of a journal article or just lab presentations. And I want to show you a little demo video of how um, S Dash works because I want to show that it is actually easy and painless. So what you see here is the um, current layout of the smart figure dashboard of S Dash. And you can see I already have some content, but now I will just drag and drop one figure and it immediately pops up. So no hassle whatsoever. I can, if I want to change the information around to around it. So here I'm editing the title. I can add the description, which is quite standard for figures. But I also have the option on the right, you can see to add keywords or um, sources, which could be underlying data, or in this case, I'm uploading um, analysis script, for example, that I've used to create this figure. And now I have this package and I can um, immediately share it with a group that I trust. I can also create a new group. It could be my lab, a collaboration. And I also have the option now to um, just go and straight make this figure public. So now I have this published figure. And um, if you want to, you can scan this QR code now and go to this exact figure because I have published it yesterday. So this is the platform that we want to make 
really user friendly and currently it's in a pilot phase. If you want to give it a try, really happy for any kind of feedback. I'm also looking for alpha testers and uh, yes, it would be great to get some feedback. You can find my poster on Zenodo and I will also share some links in a moment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hannah. This is very exciting. And uh, there is already a question to you in, uh, in the Q&A. Uh, and um, I'm happy to present our last but not the least speaker, who is uh, Kevin Alvaro Handoko from uh, International Federation of Medical Students Associations. And he'll talk about uh, enabling students in research through peer assisted learning. Over to you, Kevin. Thank you so much. Um, is, uh, can you see the poster? Yes. Okay, thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kevin. Um, I am alongside here with uh, Madalina. We are representing uh, AFMSA and uh, SCORI. So AFMSA is an international federation of medical students association. We represented 1.3 million uh, medical students worldwide. And in comedy on research exchanges, we worked on research exchanges, research education, research activities, and so on. And uh, today we'd like to present what we have worked on um, regarding, um, regarding our re uh, capacity building and research. It's called Enabling Students in Research Through Peer Assisted Learning. According to the UNESCO Science Report, there is an unequal distribution of research throughout the world. In AFMC, we also have a survey on access to research and research education. So based on this survey, um, this is a worldwide survey. Uh, we surveyed uh, medical students uh, all over the world, and we found that 98% think that research is important in medical education. However, only 20% think that research is sufficiently adjust. So there are a lot of people, a lot of medical students think that research is insufficiently adjust. So we, we create uh, an entirely new workshop that is called Ready, Ready to Conduct Research. So our Ready workshop or um, the, uh, Research Education Advancement and Development for Youth. So Ready is a peer-led research workshop that focuses on improving students' knowledge and skills in research. Uh, Ready is a workshop that focuses on um, educating people um, to be able to conduct research and utilize research to um, implement them in national and local level. And we um, try to focus our, our workshop through knowledge and skills uh, based on our framework that we created. We have AFMSA basic research competency framework. So this frameworks basically guide us to um, and identify what is the most important thing that uh, students need uh, to be able to conduct a research. So as you can see here, the basic research competencies framework, um, we have analyst, author, and investigator. So uh, the heart of re uh, research is being an analyst, an author, and an investigator. However, being a, research, a researcher is, is much more than that. So in the core of it, we have um, we try to teach students to be a collaborator and to be a professional. So these are our framework that we used uh, to be based uh, for these workshops. And in this workshop, we also uh, try to um, improve student knowledge and skills through um, youth involvement for research in global health. So we, we, we also talk how research and research education are actually needs to be utilized. And it's very important to achieve sustainable development goals universal health coverage and other global health issues. In this edition, um, on the July uh, edition, we, uh, we highlighted three different global health issues regarding planetary health, mental health, and comprehensive sexuality education. And the output of this uh, workshop is to plan and present activities that utilize research for national and local implementation. So once they get um, the 
workshop or the capacitation in international level, uh, we wish to have them uh, to be uh, for them to be able to conduct and implement this in more national and local level as FMSA worked um, to think globally and act locally. And then uh, based on this already workshop assessment, it has a tremendous uh, amount of increase of knowledge and skills in research. So this is the rating out of, uh, out of five. So from 3.09, it increased to 4.66. And then the understanding of research in global health from the rating out of five. So we have the pre-evaluation form from 3.19 to 4.58. So this workshop shows that it, it is very important and it's very um, impactful. Um, even though this is, this is a peer assisted learning, it is increased people knowledge and skills in research. And it also shows uh, a huge increase in understanding of research in global health. If you have any more questions regarding um, uh, regarding this workshop or regarding affluency or scoring in general, uh, feel free to contact us um, through our email uh, in scoryd at affluency. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we welcome question uh, uh, Q and A's um, to the chats. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Kevin. That's very very useful. Um, so, colleagues, if you have questions to Kevin, please post them in a Q&A or raise your hand and uh, we'll let you speak up. Uh, and we have one uh, question in a Q&A and it's kind of broad, but it mentions fair sharing. So I guess it's a question to Alison, but let, let me read it. And if others also want to answer it, please uh, jump in. So it's a question from uh, Lindsay Anderson. Thank you for that information. That's very exciting. We have an institutional project data report, which houses various data packages, DOIs, raw and process data linked to acquisition sources, sources related to specific project data set uh, download pages, using many standards, reporting guidelines, etc. And we'd love to chat about a few ideas, questions for linking to fair sharing database DOIs as methods. I can use the provided contact from the chat. Not sure if our database applies as an entry in your database or not, sir. But to get a better idea of the content I'm referring, I have various created content here. And uh, there is a link. Uh, so I don't know if Alison, you, you'd like to take that one. Um, Thank you very much. I was I was in the process of composing a reply, but this will be a lot quicker. <laughs> yes, so we do store information about institutional repositories in fair sharing. And I'll pop the link uh, for the for the for how you can look at which ones we already have later on in the in the chat in a moment. Um, so what what uh, Lindsay has there is is a repository specific to our institution where they store research data. And we're quite happy uh, to have such records in fair sharing if you wish to describe your institutional repository, because even though it may only be for submissions for researchers that belong to that institution, certainly everyone can view it and download your data and get access. So you're making data available. And so we're very happy to register such resources in fair sharing, and we have already done a few. So I'll pop the, I'll pop the, the link for Lindsay in the chat, but hopefully that answers that question. Thank you so much. Um, and we have uh, five minutes left. So if uh, you still have any questions to Kevin, Madalena, Hannah, Alison, Jeannie, Julian, uh, please uh, raise your hand or, or write them in a Q&A or in a chat. Uh, and uh, what I'd, I'd like to ask everyone if, um, of course, if you don't mind, or if you could share one thing that you're looking forward to happen next year. I don't know if, if there is an, anything exciting that is going to happen or you expect to happen next year, which you didn't have a chance to talk about in your five minutes. And by the way, stellar job. Uh, you've all done great uh, covering so much in your five minutes. But if there is one 
one thing you're looking forward to happen uh, or work on next year and if you'd like to share that sir uh, please do so so uh, if i may <laughs> yes please hannah and then jenny yeah, so I hope that um, next year I will have lots of feedback on what features uh, we need on S dash because I mean already now somebody mentioned the octopus in the chat and the science, sorry the science octopus and yeah I see there's like lots of other uh, ideas around and other platforms being developed and I wonder if we will find it if we have a niche or if the if we can sort of join the efforts and and the killer feature that will then take off the project. And I hope next year I will know what this killer feature is, or if you already included it, and then I can present how many people are already using our platform. That would be great. Thanks a lot, Hanum. Chini? Yes, I think um, the only thing I realized I forgot to say uh, at the end of my presentation is hopefully what we want to do is bring together an intersectional community of practice uh, in, in practice research and, and bring together all of the researchers, librarians, archivists, cur curators, research, research data managers, research managers, all those people who are interested. We're having lots of different conversations in different communities and it'd be amazing to bring them all into one place. So that's, that's I think, our, our aim for next year. Thanks a lot. And Kevin and Madalina. Uh, can um, I just can you... <laughs> so who would like to go first? Oh, perhaps. sorry. <laughs> perhaps perhaps you, you could start, Kevin. Uh, could you repeat what should I do? Uh, what's... What are your expectations for the next year? What's what, what's one thing that you you expect to happen uh, that would uh, like an exciting thing for you for your work? Thank you so much. So um, first, personally, I would like to uh, to see more youth um, engage in uh, and engage engage in engaging in in this uh, first conference. I think. Um, I think this is a very great um, conference to actually showcase that um, youth can make a change through research communications and uh, research outputs and, and so on. And uh, I believe that uh, hopefully we can engage more um, next year. And uh, I, I just hope that uh, all the best for, uh, for the rest of the conference and hopefully um, we could have a more impactful engagement, especially um, through uh, FMSA um, in uh, Force uh, 11 conference. Maybe Madi would like to add. Yes, thank you very much. So just to end what Kevin started from our side specifically, I would like to see our basic competencies, uh, basic research competencies framework being implemented and starting to uh, have local students and even national organization actually start to work on the implementation in their undergraduate curricula because we are all aware that access to research and research education is a topic that at least from a student's perspective should be uh, more talked about. And as Kevin mentioned, Youth involvement is always important because in the end, uh, it is important to have student involvement continuously because that continuously analogies the diversity of students and validating and authorizing them to represent their own ideas, their own opinions, their own knowledge and their own experience in the end. And that will improve medical schools worldwide. So we are looking to see more of that, I would say. Thanks a lot. And Alison? Yes, thank you. Uh, in terms of fair sharing and the things that we're going to be looking forward to in the next year, on the one hand, I'm starting to see an uh, increase in maturity of tools that are looking at how fair a resource is, either in terms of enabling fair data or alignment with uh, standardized uh, formats. And although we don't develop such a tool ourselves, we certainly are seeing a lot more uptake in our API um, through these third party tools that are there for FAIR assessment and uh, any kind of data management associated with FAIR. So I think that there's going to be, we're gonna see more and more maturation of such tools over the next year or so. 
and also increasing connectivity of, um, of, of these different resources. There's some really great stuff we're looking forward to doing with Open Air. And I know there's some people on here today that are related to Open Air and we're, 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 working, we're working with them to increase how much we share with them and give fair sharing uh, and Open Air a little bit more um, visibility within the knowledge graph that they make. So that's for us. <laughs> the, I hope that's not too rambly. Thanks a lot. Um... So there's also one question from Lindsay, and it's it's very broad one, but let's, let's try. So it's a general question. Uh, how are all defining uh, persistent identifiers when knowledge built from publications on products rely on connecting multiple persistent identifiers? What becomes of persistent identifiers when reused and linking to historical applications from previous versions? Would someone like to take a step answering that? Well, it depends on the type of persistent identifiers. We have a variety of different identifiers listed in fair sharing. I think there's close to 20 identifiers, schema records in fair sharing. So I think it depends on your answer. We use DOIs, and in theory, they're meant to only point to a stable object, a digital object. But in practice, I know a number of uh, instances where this isn't quite the case. I would have to know a little bit more Lindsay, about your particular question in relating to different versions. I know that DOIs have the ability to implement versioning. And so you can incorporate into the DOI, you, you, you create uh, what version of the digital object it is. But I don't know so much about the other types. Thanks a lot, sir. And thanks again, everyone, for joining today's session. And um, apologies that we went over time. Um, um, have uh, a good rest of the day or nice evening and uh, see you at other post 2021 sessions and um, thanks again to all speakers to Osman and Emma for supporting this session and to everyone who attended uh, and let's keep conversations going on Slack. Uh, thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you Bye. Rita. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone.